Hello, welcome again to another one of our live streams. Uh, today we are chatting with uh, Sophie. So, uh, people who are watching, we've got a couple of viewers. Um, if you can tell us if the sound's okay, and, and then we will be able to make a start. Uh, Phantom Wolf says, hey, straight away in the chat. So, Sophie, um, ceramicist at the university. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah, so I've been doing ceramics for, well, I've just finished my fifth year um, in education for ceramics right now. Um, so I've just done my second year um, of this three-year course. Um, I previously did a level three, which was two years um, at college. Um, stayed on to do my foundation diploma, um, specialised in ceramics again with that one. Um, and now I'm here at uni about to approach my final year and it's flying by honestly i can't believe we're in five years so um just enjoy it enjoy making enjoy seeing people's reactions when you see my work yeah. you know so it gives me joy at the end of the day great so what we'll do is we'll um in the usual format that we do we will head over to the main screen now get rid of my face uh have a quick look at your instagram and then we'll find out what you're what you're going to be making for us today okay so let's bring up your Instagram. This is where I'm going to just check that I haven't got um, a couple of screens. We've also got uh, Keris in the background as well. Keris, if you want to say hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah. can, oh, people in the chat, let us know if you can hear Keris as well. We should be able to because you can hear me. So Instagram, we're not going to go massively into deep dive Instagram that we've done in the past, just because it's mainly pictures of Sophie gaming. <laughs> Yes. Oh god. <laughs> so it's the, the, <laughs> the picture we've got on the screen. Um, do you want to talk us about this project? Yeah. So um, that was our final project, um, specialist study. So it was themed on uh, light and space. So we got to pick our own like a theme that we enjoyed um, or something we found like an interesting. And we can actually see them in the background here. Um, so I looked at octopuses because um, I always have like a theme with my work. It's always like animal based or nature based um, to try and bring like stories across in a lot of my work. Um, so these ones were based on how like, uh, you, you might have seen all those videos. I don't know if viewers have or not. Um, like octopuses that can like squash themselves into like a box. Like the octopus is like yay big. It can just go into a small box. So we um, spend, 12 weeks from theory to final production on those chairs. Um, and I used like extruded clay and we made, um, made a box. It was like, it's huge. And we just like shoved a load of clay in. Um, and then that's what came out. Like. So it just looks like that octopus has been splashed um, in my work. And um, but I had fun making it. We hit some snacks along the way. Um, but you do when you're making and you have to, mm -hmm. you have to, you know, find new ways of moving ahead if something doesn't quite work right. You know, you can get someone's opinion um, or you figure out yourself like a different way of um, moving across or with those ones. I had fun with it, I've got to say. They are, they are small, but I think they're cute myself. You say um, this small. The picture that's on the screen now, the, the, you could sit on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can sit on them. You can do whatever. Sit on them. Um, we think we took some daft pictures where I'm like lying on them, and um, you can use them however you want, really. That's why I intended them to be like kind of like Lego bricks. Mm -hmm. um, so you could, if if I had more time, like the bottom bit would have been done a bit better. But um, you could have them like horizontal, vertical, you can sit on them against the wall. Um, there's many ways you can use my seats. It's not just like some standard, oh, it's, it's a stool. No, you can use it as a footrest. Um, anything yeah. really, yeah. Sapling Wolf in the chat's put, they look like they look a bit like bookends. <laughs> I think you'd need quite a large bookshelf for that. <laughs> and quite a heavy oh, duty bookshelf. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're quite heavy but yeah the, yeah the project was about seating wasn't it that you had to yeah. make yeah. make interactive seating i mean i think they're quite light compared to everyone else's 
Guys, did you say you, you posted a picture of this on the Applied Arts uh, Instagram? Uh, yes, yeah, so on SEA Applied Arts uh, on Instagram, you yeah, can see you. Sophie lying across them. <laughs> we, had, we, had, we, we had some fun kind of photographing the students sitting on their different seats. So it's a, it's a top, I did multiple pictures, so it's a, the, oh, the okay. last picture. Yeah. No, no, the, yeah, that one. The, the most recent one posted. No, That's it's the it. keep. <laughs> the, the, there you go. That the one. one. The person sitting on something. Yeah. So this was the project for seats. There we yeah. go. <laughs> so also used as a bed. <laughs> there we go. I, I was very impressed that Sophie managed to do that. I managed to actually balance on it. Oh, there. <laughs> really passed out. <laughs> no, we had good fun. So is that is that something that happens all the time in ceramics? Would you say you have? Yeah, yeah, fun. we all have a laugh um, because there's like there's only a few of us. Um, so I think how many have been, been five of us um, on the in the ceramics side of things. Um, you get really close like to each other, you know. Well, obviously not with COVID. Like, come on, got to keep two meters apart and um, get to know each other well. And you can have a laugh. You come in, you know, you're gonna get on with the work. You know, if, if you're not feeling quite good that day, someone's going to pick you up and say, come on, your work's fine. If your work's not going fine, they're like, no, but it's, you know, we all uh, have each other's backs in ceramics. We don't just fight. <laughs> and, and I'd like to say, in, in jewellery metalwork, the, our other main specialist material, they, they also have each other's back. <laughs> Makes it sound like the, the, the jewellery okay, metalwork. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like a so you basically start throwing clay at jewelry metalwork and they throw bits of metal back. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an ongoing war. So I can't but, quite throw on the wheels, so I'll just. Uh... <laughs> so we got a couple of people in the chat already. Um, people said hi. We've got um, Stunbot. Go, Sophie. <laughs> I'll go so f um then we've also got the um golden guy nine love the penguin so that's the penguin in the background i don't think that that's something that we we just we oh. placed there we're not even sure where that came from i don't know who it is um it I, th I think it's one of the first years from last it, will be one, it might have been from your year sophie from last year in my year yeah i don't remember anything. it's not it's not more even though it might be somebody who then specialised in metal, I don't know. I don't remember anyone making it, don't And then the next question from Golden Guy 9 is, what's your best creation? Oh, um, that would be, that would be my, um, uh, my exhibition from second year of uh, college. So I'd made, um, I think, it, I say it's six foot. It was like a massive eagle. Um, I made three pieces of work, the eagle, frog, and a snake. Um, they, they can be found on my Instagram, past all the gaming selfies. Um, <laughs> Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, it was, it was huge, and I absolutely loved him. I spent, I think it was 10 weeks on making them. Um, he was definitely my best creation. Um, but saying that, I'm proud of nearly everything I make. Like, I love them seats as well, the colour. You know, it's trying different different themes out. Like I've never made a, a seat from clay before. I've never made a seat at all. So, <laughs> so definitely my eagle will be my favourite piece. But um, sadly, he's no longer with us because ceramics, as fun as it is to make, they break. Is is it this one? Yeah, that's him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a. Uh, he was my favourite piece. I think it was at that point, that's when I figured out um, I wanted to carry on with ceramics at uni because I had so many people interested in wanting to buy him. Um, however, I said no, because at that point we'd not like done anything towards pricing and yeah. you know the business side of things. Um, so many people were interested, wanted to buy it. Um, and the frog as well, I think, I think um, somewhere that would be my frog. Um, he had a lot of interest. Um, luckily, he still survived. He's at home. 
Um, try not to break him. Yeah. It's just the, the, like, the look on people's faces when they see it. Like, they came to the exhibition, they come around the corner like, oh, oh. I love it. They love it. So now, now that you've been in university for a while and stuff, and you've done various different modules on making a living and stuff, so would you now, if you if you were to make these pieces now, would you be confident enough to sell them? Yeah. Um, so as I've mentioned, I, like, I didn't know business stuff. And um, one of the things we do here at uni in your um, second year is you learn, it's called Creative Futures. So you learn how to like price your work, um, the whole business aspect of, say, if you wanted to leave uni and become that ceramicist. Um, yeah, I think I'd be confident now because I now know how to like price my work by my hours um, and professionally making work to sell. Definitely. So I've got all the skills behind me now. Um, I'm still gaining skills. It's not, it, you don't stop learning with ceramics. It's like an ongoing learning curve. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So if you, if someone approached you now, how would, how would they be able to buy something off you? Do you have a website or do you? Um, not currently, of... um, but that's like a work in progress now. So um, that's a project for summer would be, setting up uh, like professional Instagram, a website, um, maybe an Etsy and that one. And it's just like checking out where you can sell and what works best, uh, what's going to get the viewers, of course, to see the work. So, so yeah, that's, that's really part of the, the Creative Futures module in third year, isn't it? Where, so, so this year we let you mm. have a, a mocked up website um, where next year it has to be a live website at the end. So yeah, it's that kind of doing it in stages, isn't it? So that you can yeah. run so by, so by the end of next year, end. everything will be up and ready um, into the big wide world. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. You, so what you're saying is people should save their money now, ready for when your website Yeah, goes. save your money now and you can buy my work later. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a few more in, in the uh, comments um we've got sapling wolf how many times have you dropped your work oh um i don't i don't think i've ever dropped a bisque fire so when when a bisque fire piece is when you put it in for its first firing and it's kind of like a not i don't even know so this, this is bisque fire this is uh when it goes in so if you were to drop that that would smash crap all the hell break loose um I don't know. Maybe two or three times. I know I dropped some in college, and the eagle that we spoke about, he got dropped, but I didn't drop him. So I never got to see him ever again after that exhibition. So sad. Um, I've dropped clay in, in this state when it's soft, um, and that's when it distorts, and you have to be so careful, um, depending on if you've got any like texture on it um yeah a fair few times i think i'm quite careful i try to be careful because i don't want anything to break but again nature of ceramics you know you've got to take risks um things could break in a kiln and um, during a firing um so it's always nervous when you open the kiln for the first time and you hear it breaks it's safe Definitely. So, but you can also, as you're saying about when it's in, in the kind of the soft state that you're working mm -hmm. with, you can really play around with the distortion, you know, intentionally distorting it. And that's something you were doing before Christmas, wasn't it? When you were kind of draping. Your, yeah, your, yeah. Your that's and, 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 bowls and, on that one, yeah. So um, you, you can, in a way, have um, control, but I didn't, I, I left my, my clay to just do whatever it could with the gravity, so. I like gravity control that one. And then, and then enjoyed making it lots of mess with the... <laughs> with, <laughs> with the, the, the bucket. <laughs> you know, the string the bucket. Yeah, yeah, what you were doing with it. <laughs> oh, that, that was great fun. Um, oh, it was like a pendulum. And we uh, we had, it's all our ceilings, but like, we hung the bucket. So you know you see those videos of like people with paint and a canvas and they, they let the bucket go and it, and it swings and you get that really nice um, pattern. We've done that with um, 
fill the whole floor with the slabs and we put a porcelain slip in the bucket because that's like runny clay, really runny liquid consistency. Um, and we let it go and it made these great, like, um, I forget what they're called now. On camera shy. There's a certain word for them. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it. There's a lot of stuff we forget. I, I tend to forget all sorts <laughs> when we're talking on this. Uh, I, I forgot Game of Thrones a few weeks ago and I was going, that program with dragons and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it happens, doesn't it? Uh, Sapling Wolf put that. Uh, wow, that's a cool frog. Golden Guy Nine. Uh, I do a bit of sculpting myself. So, have you got any tips for budding sculptors? Um, I mean, for me, it was just have fun. Like people say, I I can't do art. I can't draw. Like I'm not very good at drawing. Um, but like if someone turned around and said, can you make me something? I'd be like, well, yeah, give it a good shot. Um, if you're going to sculpt something big, like I've done with these pieces here. Um, let me go down. Here's one I made earlier. Um, they're not solid clay. So um, I'm sculpting with, this is just newspaper balled up and um, stuck together. And then I've gone and rolled like a slab of clay. Um, and draped it over it. So if you're going to go anything bigger, I'd say, than something that fit in your palm, start with like newspaper to bulk it because it'll make your piece a lot lighter um, in a sense that this won't be solid clay. Um, that's, that's what I tend to do. I think that's a good way of starting. Um, just have fun. Like, if you don't like the look of it at the end of the day, you, you can change it. Like, clay, clay isn't paint on a canvas if you're not happy with it you, you know um if it's if it ever does dry too much you can break it down and reclaim the clay um and start over again so i think it's a really good material to work with yeah. that's that interesting level. that you you're using sort of old paper yeah it just makes it a lot easier um all of these that i've set up with um it's just just paper i did the same with them the frog and the eagle and the snake, they that just was paper in the middle. And then I'm sculpting on top of that paper. Just general newspaper, anything, any scraps. Works works best. So there's lots of different reasons for doing that, isn't there, Sophie? So if you it not only does it mean that it's the piece will be lighter and you're using less clay, but also it will dry quicker, because if it's solid mm -hmm. clay it'll take forever to dry. Yeah, um, so, so um we all know about the teeth. things drying out. I'm <laughs> trying to get things to dry or trying to stop them from drying out. And, yeah, 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 definitely. So, um, some of the, the tubes for the seats they were um, solid clay, so we had to. I was quite lucky with the time constraints, I'd, I'd done them really fast because of the production method with them. Um, so I had enough time to let them dry before going in the kiln. Um, and another thing is, as well, if you are going to go into ceramics. Um, you don't want these to be solid, yeah, um, because of drying times, but also um, it could blow up in the kiln. So you always have to make sure there's a hole somewhere in your work. So I had to hide to pace hundreds of holes onto those pieces to make sure it didn't blow up in the kiln. Um, that was scary, hoping they didn't blow up. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we were speaking when we were setting up um, the, the the equipment today for today's stream about mm -hmm. like I, I'm from a completely different discipline um you know the digital side of the faculty and this is something that's been good for me to to see sort of how applied artists work and fine artists and things like that and that's why I get to ask the silly questions because obviously I don't work in this department so I I know I didn't know that ceramics blew up in kilns Mm -hmm. and that's why there's a is that so is that why there's a hole in the bottom of yeah so the, um the... obviously your kiln um abyss fire into a thousand degrees celsius right um hot air expands so if, if this was hollow but completely without a hole somewhere it would just go it blow up because the air inside would be expanding because of the heat yeah. so you always have to make sure that if you are doing something big and has no holes but has air inside, always put a hole. Or it just has to be like a tiny little pinprick. It doesn't have to be massive. 
Um, just enough for that air to escape during the firing. That's really interesting. The, uh, there's a couple more people put some stuff in the chat. Adele, uh, I love the joys of messy, creative in brackets studio space. I think I think the studio is quite tidy compared to to some studios in the art school. Um, ah. At least at least today I didn't have to climb over anything, uh, which I have to in the fine art studios. Um, it take me life in my hands when I go in there. Hey, the, the applied art studios have never been so clean as they have been this year because we're cleaning everything down at the end of each day to keep everyone <laughs> safe. But uh, honestly, they've never been so clean. <laughs> I think it's great. Yeah, definitely have been cleaners. Uh, Sapling Wolf's put it like those Spirograph. Some oh, she that's was when we talked about the thing. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, I did have a play around because I do have one of them at home. Um, uh, I think you've, you might have mentioned this before, but Golden Guy Nines are asking, what are you sculpting? Sculpting right now? Um, well, just playing around really with, with different shapes. So I had a go earlier, um, I'll bring this one up to the camera so you can have a look. Um, with different like kind of coral ideas. Um, let me get a good shot of this. Is that straight? Can you see? Yeah, we, we it's a bit fuzzy because fuzzy of the um, focus, but it, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I, I've um, better, there you go. just have to go with like, different textures because mm -hmm. um, I know some people are scared of holes, so look away now, but um, different types of coral. Um, like I said, I like making pieces of work that are based on like nature, animals. Um, we're just having to go with textures on this one. So we're going to have a go and see what we can do on the other pieces um, for that one. It's dead, it's dead fun to have a play around with different shapes that you can make on these. So we've just got holes, we've got um, like tubes I've stuck on the top. These are just little pieces of clay. Um, I'll show you as we're going along and having a chat. Trip, tryptophobia, I think you've just yeah. absolutely killed off half the audience <laughs> with tryptophobia there. Um, when we were chatting before, we also had. Um, it's Prodigy OW, awesome stream, and also thank you for the follow. They followed us before too. Uh, and they've asked, also asked, is there a special paint for ceramics? Uh, greetings from Switzerland. <laughs> sort of true. Um, no, really. Just, just have fun. So, I love it. So it, we you don't we don't paint ceramics, do we? It's kind no, of no, 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 no glazes. glazes. So they, yeah. that, that looks like acrylic paint, I guess, from a distance. Um, no, we have glazes. Um, there's different types depending on how you want to glaze it and how you want the outcome to look. Mm -hmm. um, would it be cheeky if I grabbed some of the first year's work to just show off Raku? Uh, no, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. So, just don't break any. Just don't break any, Sophie. Oh, no. this, is, this is where she trips over one of the wires that I've left across the floor. No. <laughs> so my my chair. So that was a um, lead blaze. So that's a really uh, low firing. Um, on that one, I think it's ten twenty. I'll have to double check on that one. I'm pretty sure it's like ten twenty degrees on that. Um, You've got Raku firing. This is um, this is the lowest, nine hundred to thousand degrees on this one. So mm -hmm. um, it's really fuzzy. My bad. Um, this one could be done outside. Um, it's a Japanese style of, of glazing. Um, and you have different metals in the glazes. So what happens is you put it in um, in its bisque state with the glaze that you've applied on top. Um, and then once it's out, you you reduce the amount of air that can get to it. So you put it in like a, a bin with sawdust. And so this area might be able to see with the, with the copper shine. So that's where air has not been able to get to it. It's brought the copper to the surface. We get these really nice blues and greens, um, purples as well. And then I think this is another piece. I'm not sure who's made this one, but I love it. Um, I think, so there's a little bit of glaze on here um, where it's shining. However, I think this might have been put in and then 
just left to burn. It might have had a masking fluid or something on top, so the glaze didn't touch. Yeah. Um, yeah, a, I'm, yeah. Not sure, I'm, I'm not sure if that was one of the, you know, the naked raccoon ones where you... Was it? So it might be, or it might be that it's... Um, so I should explain that naked raccoon doesn't mean that it's um, that you do it without clothes on. It means that you haven't <laughs> put, a, <laughs> you put something else on it, isn't it, Glaze? Um, but then also I think that some of them were like wrapping the pieces in um, copper wire as well, which will then obviously give kind of burning, melting patterns. So you have to be like really careful because glazes. So um, there's a drip here. So a glaze basically is just glass um, that you're applying to the surface, but in like a a dry. Well, it's wet and then it dries. But once you're firing it, the glass comes. You have to be super careful for shards. So you see how it's dripped there. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really careful when doing things like that. I've just popped up the Instagram there of them doing the raku, is it, in the in the car park, just outside the the applied arts building. So you can see the frontage there of a bit of our building. It's this old sort of Crimean War hospital type structure, but in just in front of the applied arts building there. Okay, so you, I, I'm not going to even sort of embarrass myself by saying the names of these things, but I'm, I'm assuming that's a dustbin. Yes, that's a dustbin. Um, so, and a, and a yeah, so we, we we had we had three days of, of production um, with the first years coming in, um, doing kind of just Wayne who works in the ceramics area. He was there's Wayne. Um, bless him. He was just kind of constantly firing. I think we did like doing like 17 firings in a day. So so the work goes into a, a kiln, which is what you can see Wayne actually about to take things out. I think, um, and it gets taken up to. Um, about a thousand degrees and then you take the piece out when it's really hot and you put it into the dustbin that's filled with um uh, like sawdust and your newspaper or whatever the combustibles are you let it set fire a bit and then you put the lid on so it cuts out that the oxygen then um and then you can quench it and and there, there you have it you've got your piece it's, I mean, it's quite dramatic and and if you like it's, it's quite a low-tech firing really so if you if you if you like kind of um setting fire to things then then the applied arts in general is perfect because so we... i think it's one of the is it one of the fast, uh, fastest fastest ways to um see a fire like blaze as well yeah and it's yeah. i mean it's it's got its jeopardy in there because obviously you've got a lot of thermal shock happening but yeah so it's a really fast way of glazing and also like smoke firing gives you like kind of really amazing kind of surface as well that's even faster it's literally just a bit of um mix of sawdust that you put onto your work and set fire to it and, and you're all wearing your masks, which is... Obviously. Right there, COVID, <laughs> COVID safe. Very good. It's yeah, we do, we do like a bit of fire. Yeah. <laughs> we like setting fire to things, whether that's metal or clay or wood, anything. We like burning stuff. Uh, it's Prodigy's put in the chat. Is the heat controllable and does it depend on the volume of the ceramic art? They're new to ceramics, they put as well. Um, so, I uh, hope so you might have to help me out on this. Um, sorry, the full disclosure should say I'm a jeweler <laughs> rather than a ceramicist. Um, <laughs> so, so, it's, um, so, yeah, we've got we the the you, the you saw in the picture before there was like the kind of the, the a kiln with the the big flamethrower kind of going in, but it's also there's a thermometer, a special py or pyrometer that's there. So we've got additional readouts. So we know how hot. The kiln is um so as we know when we've got it to the right stage and then it's it's all about kind of sort of cooling really when we're putting it in the dustbin so it's it's cooling down it's kind of being burnt by the combustibles it's stopping air getting to certain areas of it to give you those colors and everything else and then and then it just makes sure that it's not too hot when you you kind of put it into the tin bath filled with water you can let it just cool down naturally. You don't have to quench it. It's just that when you're doing so many in one day, you need to kind of get through that that process quite quickly. I believe. <laughs> Sophie, does that does that sound realistic? Have I, do, have I talked? Yeah, yeah. Sense I've, record, I've, not yeah. Made, I've not just made it up. <laughs> no, 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 that's right. Like, um, if you want, like, um, there's a white crackle glaze. Oh, no, it's been like a year since I've done racket. If I can remember it, you... With the white crackle, um, you, if you, do you chuck it into water straight away? And it just they, they were spray. Yeah. I know with some of them, they were spraying water, so it's coming out of the kiln oh, onto, okay. onto just a kiln shelf on the car park um, yeah. floor. 
and spraying water on it before they then um, did something else. Yeah, because that's, that's what the thermal trap does. So you're going from like that really high temperature to like air temperature, room temperature, it's completely, it shrinks parts of the glaze. So that's what causes the cracks to form. We, we might have to one. get Wayne in. <laughs> <laughs> you have to give him a shout. <laughs> I did ask him earlier on if he was up for doing a, a Twitch stream for us because I think we... Oh, I should have done crystalline glazes. Yeah. <laughs> so is, what other kind of glazes is there? So you, like, obviously when I have my dinner and we got my plates, that's a diff completely different glaze, surely? Um, you've got you've got raku, uh, earthenware, stoneware. So there's the lead glaze, um, mm -hmm. raku. I can't remember. We did the, we did this glaze theory earlier this year, and I, I did a, we had to do tests of, of glazes. Now I don't know if you can see it in the background, but up there, uh, glaze theory and how to mix our own glazes. Um, that's something you learn when you're here. Um, I'd, I'd say that wasn't particularly my favourite thing so far, but um, learn from it. Um, <laughs> that one. We all did. So you've also got things like on gobes, which are like a really intense colour. You've got um, uh, you can have sort of underglaze colours, so you kind of like putting pigments and things onto the, the clay, which you then put a glaze, a clear glaze or colour glaze over the top, so you get different layers and different effects. Um, and then on glaze colours, where you've glazed it and then you can sort of sort of like drawing on top, but then each time it has to go through a firing in the kiln to make it permanent. I don't know if that's answered your question or not. <laughs> yeah, <I'm, laughs> it, it, it just see it's quite quite intricate and quite detailed. A, a lot of knowledge to store, I suppose, of different types of ceramics and temperatures and trying to not let things explode. A lot it's of um, like chemicals as well. Yeah. You know what, what goes into the glaze. You have to be super careful because you've got um, there's like lead, sodium bicarb. Um, you, to, you do have to take care when mixing those, especially. It's um, a hot subject, ceramics. That's a bad joke, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you've got things like, yeah, it's all like, enough. I, I mean, I don't, again, it's not my area, so, but things I've picked up over the years, like borosilicate and cobalt and iron oxide and copper oxide. And yeah, there's, it's all about, it's real kind of, Proper chemistry, isn't it? The the glaze recipes yeah. and and kind of all the measurements and quantities and everything else. It it does sound quite complex. <laughs> my my little brain is uh, not got enough space for all that. In terms of come becoming a student at the university, how did that come about? How did you uh... find out about the ceramics course? So we obviously coming from um, college. Um, I'd come for an open day. Oh my gosh, that'd be three, three years ago, three, four. Um, we came for an open day. We came to look around um, and fell in love with it. I had my interview. Um, got off of the place. Um, however, I did I did defer a year. Took a year out. Um, during that year, I travelled a bit. Um, worked a bit, put some like you know some money behind her as you do, um, and here I am, second year in, loving it, making things, um, and just just practicing like because there, there's like really 14 of us on um, on the course. Like I said before, you get to know each other really well, um, and you get a lot of like one-on-one -on -one time with the tutors, so one-to-ones a lot. You know, if, if you ever need help, um, you just just ask for it and it's there, definitely. So I'm, assuming, I'm assuming from that, would you would you recommend people to do the ceramics? Yeah, 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 yeah. If you really want to like expand your skills, you know, like I came from college, there's some people on this course that have just gone straight into making. Um, definitely, if you really want to expand or learn something new, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've enjoyed it, you know, two years, I'm still here. I just love it. Love making. So, because you, you just said that you love making, what are you, what's that you're putting on the clay now? Is that some sort of glue? So, or is that... um, potter's knife, um, we're just scoring the surface. 
Okay. Um, on this one, so if you ever want to attach anything, so surface to surface, you've got to make sure you score both areas. So this is going to go about here. So I've me measured it. Um, once you've scored both areas, you have to apply slip. So it's kind of like brick laying in a way. Yeah. Um, slip is just clay watered down. Um, this one's not as runny as what we spoke about before with the porcelain. It's quite gritty, this one. Um, and you apply that to your scored areas. It's just so your joints secure because you don't want anything falling off in the kiln because clay shrinks as well during um, firing. So I think it's 10%, 10 or 12% mm -hmm. clay will shrink. So you always have to take into consideration as well, like sizes of things. So if you wanted something, I think like, like my seats they were a tiny bit bigger than that. So they have shrunk. Um, you just have to make sure everything is secured so well when you're making. Someone just broke in. <laughs> the, um, so you said before that you've got paper inside that. How does that fare up in the kiln? So um, the paper, in, in theory, will, will burn away. Um, it'll still be inside. It'll be like a really thin ash. So it'll come out of the bottom as an ash on them. It's like, it's like dust. It's completely nothing. Um, so what I'll do with these is... is so I've completely covered the bottom of this one. Um, I'll cut a hole big enough, and then when they get sit on um, a kiln shelf, I mean, it depends. If the, the hole's big enough, you might be able to rip the paper out. I've done that in the past where I've just cut it, taken it out. Um, but if the clay's super soft, you don't want to do that too soon because it'll it'll distort um, that one. I think I think there's, you can put metal in as well. Um, I've not done that myself. However, there's some students that are working with the ceramic and metal, and they can go in the kiln. Hoping yes. that they do metal. I'm not. I'm not sure what metal it is. So yeah, it depends on on kind of what temperature you're going to really as to what yeah. metal you can use. But yeah, so it's a technique, isn't it? That I know you're doing it at the moment purely as an armature to kind of hold the clay in, mm -hmm. in place. But you can actually do things where you do a technique called burnouts, where you dip organic objects into um, like a slip that, that runny the runny slip um, to then and then put them in the kiln and then they burn away so that can be done with pretty much anything it's quite kind of it's an exciting process but it does tend to be quite fragile so what would happen if you just left that on the side now as would it is yeah just go hard yeah completely so sticking just it in like the kiln it. just makes it go harder quicker. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if I were to leave this out without firing it, it would just be like dry clay. But when you fire it, that's when it turns into the ceramic part. Okay. So if this if this did dry out completely, like I could break it down and uh, reclaim it. So it just add water again um, over time, and it softens up again. So there's not really a lot of waste. Um, to ceramics if you if you're good with the clay and you look after it well so i spent i think i spent last was it last week week four um I had six buckets of just off cut slime bits like like that size just completely in a bucket and you just add water to it and it soaks up again i could spend all day reclaiming clay where do you get clay from? Is it, is it, does it come ready-made like this or do you have to mix it yourself or...? Um, comes... I think we order it in... Well, it's obviously from the ground. Um, but uh, it comes ready in bags, so it's soft. I just got this straight out of the bag ready to use on that one. You can see what I yeah. mean now when I ask the silly questions about it. Well, it, it, it's, it's not a silly question yeah. though. So um, the, the most ceramicists do buy kind of bags of clay that have already gone through that refinement process. Yeah. But we do have some students and there's lots of alongside professionals that kind of dig clay themselves, literally kind of dig into the ground mm. um, to get clay. And then they, they're kind of like 
sieving it and, and kind of you know breaking it down into like a, a slop, a sort of slurry to get rid of all the impurities and then producing work with that. So it, it's, not, it's not a silly question because for ease, most people just buy clay rather than going to dig it up. But yeah. <laughs> I have seen people do that. There's a, there's a there's a TV show on Discovery, I think, called Alone, and they go get dropped off in Alaska somewhere. And there was a, a lady on that doing um, digging up clay and making her own little pots. Yeah. It's always I, I ask these questions because there'll be people out there that are maybe watching now that might be interested in doing some sort of sculpting or whatever else, but thinking that they might have to mix stuff together or what they need to buy and how to get started having a go so if i if i wanted to have a go at sculpting something now what would be the, the thing i would need to go out and buy first um well obviously your clay you're gonna want i mean some of the tools you can find probably just in your uh, kitchen kitchen drawer yeah. um i think we started off here with a fork a fork a spoon because a fork can be used for so many things especially scoring the surface um a needle like these are just what i've collected over the years so i've got got metal tools to do holes um a rubber kidney and a serrated kidney that's what we need so that's for your um surfaces of your clay um some loop tools um, they're good for cutting into the clay and getting different shapes. So I just put this in, put it out for surface texture. But definitely your kidneys are some of the best things. You, you keep, um, I was definitely coming back to kidneys because as soon as you said, what when you say kidneys, what are they actually, have you made them yourself? Have you bought them? No, no, is that an actual uh, ceramicist tool or? These are ceramicist tools, so they're just rubber, really super flexible. And um, you can use them. I use them for smoothing the surface out. Um, and then your serrated one, uh, I think you, you can really make them yourself if you have like a sheet of, I don't know, like aluminium steel and just put grooves in. Because that's, if you're like, if you scrape it down to the camera with this one. So this is one I've got scraped. This is what evens your surface out because of the grooves in the kidney. So I don't know if it's show because this camera's so fuzzy. But this, this was all bumpy and horrible and then you just scrape it back with the kidney and it starts to smooth out your surface completely. And then that's when you can go back over with a rubber one and then you can get a really soft, smooth texture on those. Because that, that's always a question I ask. I've asked the fine artists as well and the digital artists of what what are their tools, what are they using, what are their go-to things? And I think you, you, you've you answered that. And it's, what the, I see the, the cup that you've got your tools in there, have you made that yourself as well? Which one? The cup. Yellow, yeah, is that Yeah, 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 that was just a spare piece of clay um, I brought out and put together. Um, <laughs> if anyone's wondering what that noise is, you're right next jewelry. to the, the jewellery workshop. Yeah, crazy. So. Noisy, honestly. It, 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 yeah, it's okay. It's a bit noisy, but metal, at least when you drop metal, it doesn't it doesn't crack. It doesn't break. Well, I mean, if you want to drop ceramics just to get that flattened, you know, effect, <laughs> still works. Still works. <laughs> just go with it. <laughs> There's a, an on, ongoing kind of sort of, sort of jokey battle between between <laughs> metal and ceramics because um, I would say that if you if you drop the metal, the worst thing that happens is it, it dents. And you can just hit it to get the dent out again. <laughs> <laughs> so, when students come in to the applied arts course, this might be a question for Keris actually. Do they do they know what they want to do straight away? So, if I came in and was like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to be a ceramicist or a jeweler. Um. So, so, um, so we do get students like Sophie who know exactly what they want to do, but we also get students who, um, kind of all they know is they want to make 
and, and I always say it's a little bit like Cinderella's slipper. There's a material and a technique for everybody. So in the first kind of three months of the programme in first year, then you get to try lots of different materials. And then after that, you start specialising down in the materials that's right for you. And I, I famously had a student who came to do ceramics. He was like, I want to do ceramics, I'm going to do ceramics. This is my thing. I am a ceramicist. And then kind of spent some time in metal. And then he said, but well, I've just I've just spent the next module in metal, and I'm definitely going back to clay. <laughs> and then the next module came along. I was like, oh, I'll just do this one in, in, in metal, and then I'll definitely go back to clay. And then by the, by the end of his third year, he won the British Silversmiths Award. <laughs> he just kind of set up his own metal workshop, and as, as you know, kind of I think it was like two, three years on from graduation, has then come back to do our master's program, and he's absolutely a metal smith. But so, so some people do know, some people think they know, and some people have no idea. So we give that opportunity for everyone to try lots of different materials and techniques. I think I think that's what that's the, one of the good things about the university, isn't it? That we we give students that opportunity because I think it's the same it's the same across the board, really. I mean, students come in thinking, not knowing what they want to do, or they think, oh, I'm actually going to be a 3D modeler and turn into a 3D sculptor, or they, they, they come in, they want to be a 2D animator and walk away a 3D animator, or come in as a comic artist to walk away as a children's. It's not that we, we sway them that way. It's kind of you get to have a go of things that you've not had a go of before yeah and i think yeah i think that's part of it is, is that most people don't have access to the materials or the equipment mm -hmm. or you know have that exposure whether that's at school or later in life it's that kind of people kind of know they want to do something creative but don't really know what and so that is the great thing about our art school is the fact that people can kind of like move around and try different things until they find the thing that's perfect for them yeah absolutely uh, Adele in the chat has put, it looks so satisfying using the kidneys. Yeah, it's one of the best things, especially if you're going for that really smooth kind of look like right there. That's not smoothed out, might look like it because it's so far away from the camera. But um, I've yet to get a kidney on that one. And then, oh, it's just so, you, you watch it go from all scraped with the serrated kidney to like perfection. You can certainly so see it on the camera. There's like there's on the, on the. I'm not even going to embarrass myself for left and right because I think it's a mirrored a lot of the time on this. But the the one that's got two parts to it is a lot more dimpled than the one that's just one. That one. Yeah. Yeah. So you can definitely see the difference. So that was that was just two pieces of paper put together, um, with the clay on top. Um, Prodigy OW's put, do you think ceramics can be 3D printed at some point or is that a technology being used nowadays? I mean, they're already using ceramic tiles and like rockets, aren't they? Like they did on the space shuttle. Um, yeah, they, they also, um, yeah, you can, you can 3D print clay yeah. um, and you can metal, you know, so it's basically 3D print anything. So like mm -hmm. chocolate, pasta, so you can do it and it's, it's really impressive, um, but I quite like the the kind of. I think it loses a little bit of that hands-on, yeah. you know, kind of manipulating it with your your fingers. So it's like the thing with tools. So yes, Sophie's got some great tools that she's kind of made and collected. But the, the biggest tool when you're an applied artist is your hands. That's the that's the, the first thing because clay is particularly is so responsive to the human touch when when you're manipulating it. And so you can three D print. Um, directly into clay but it's it it's and i'm going to get kind of probably slated now by people who are really pro 3d printing <laughs> i just I, I just think it's a little bit yeah. kind of doing it for the sake of doing it because you can produce things that you couldn't produce any other way as opposed to really understanding and, and using the material for what the material can do and because my joke in the chat agrees with you yeah it needs to be hands-on i think it, I think it, it is. It's horses for courses, isn't it? If you're going to mass produce something, then 3D printing, fine. But if you want something that's unique, bespoke, and sort of got a bit of character to it, then it needs to be handmade, doesn't it? I mean, recently you've got that cup. The, the first family has moved into the first 3D printed house. You know, so the 3D printing is going down that route of mass producing stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, ceramics is like the ultimate kind of mass production material, really, because, you know, if you think about kind of, or, you know, kind of bathroom furniture, you think of plates, cups, everything, that they're, they're either slip cast or they're production thrown, or, you know, they've been you know, thrown into a mould. And it's it's such a, you know, it, it, it's it's kind of, you know, that real kind of functionality of, of ceramics has, has always been very mass produced. And, um, but yeah, I think the, the thing with craft or the applied arts, it's kind of the same thing really. It's, it just gets called different things in different places. It's, um, it's, it's, you can't, you have to have a physical object, otherwise it's not craft. I mean, that, that physical object can be temporary. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a permanent, but it has to be something that's been made. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's prodigy for also traditional ceramics like Japanese or other cultures can't be replicated by a computer, in my opinion, as a newbie in ceramics. Um, yeah, I mean, you can kind of copy anything, but it's it's that human touch you can't yeah. replicate. That's the, that, you know, that kind of the, the make of the marker, mm -hmm. the marker, make, the mark, I can't even say it, the mark of the maker. It's that kind of that interaction of, of kind of, physically touching a material to get it to do something else and, and there's you get faults don't you they kind of go because yeah. humans have you know kind of you always get that slight fault in something that hopefully is you can't see the fault but it's got that uniqueness and everything's very slightly individual which is not if it's from a machine absolutely we i mean you can 3d scan stuff and turn that into a 3d model and, and attempt to 3d print it to copy it but I think it's just it, 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 some things just need to be left alone, don't they? It's kind of yeah. There's a there's a really interesting ceramicist who's based in South Wales and France. She kind of goes between the two, who 3D scans um, objects and people, and mm. then print 3D prints them off, and then turns them into um, a kind of a mold to then slip cast into. And she kind of introduces kind of sensors and sound and and QR codes and everything to the work, but it's that whole thing of mixing that you know, new technology with really traditional production techniques. I don't know if I'm allowed to name drop or not. To say yeah, if it's an name. artist, we can certainly... We can yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's Ingrid Murphy. So in Ingrid Murphy does this does some really interesting, exciting things of combining technology. And you've also got another ceramicist um, called, um, I think it's Michael Eden who again does that he use he gets he's inspired by kind of the traditional kind of wedgewood urn type shapes and then 3d prints them covers them in slip and some sometimes they're fired sometimes they're not and but but kind of really kind of plays around with that kind of embedding qr codes in the structure that he's printing so so it's not it's i think there's a perception that kind of crafts are like we're kind of like ye olde sitting around <laughs> like arts and crafts movements against technology but technology is a really important part of of what we do and it, we've always been at like the kind of the forefront of inventing technology really and, or, or repurposing technology yeah i mean as, I, as, as, as a movement not not yeah. specifically us but because absolutely because you, you wouldn't in terms of casting and everything else and and you know a lot of manufacturing is based off that now isn't it so yeah uh sapping wolves but cool Go. <laughs> I suppose you didn't expect it to be quite so technical, Steve. <laughs> all the kind of, all the different um, kind of like yeah. glaze temperatures and materials, and well, yeah, it's it. quite, it's quite a technical, yeah, but hands-on creative yeah. practice. Yeah, it, it certainly lifted the lid on, on some of the stuff. I wouldn't have thought it would have been so heavy on chemicals, and um, you know. I, we do 3D sculpting um, in animation and, and what you, games as well, but it's kind of it's, it's yeah. There's something about doing it physically. So we do have a lot of animators, especially stop motion animators, who sculpt in clay. Um, you sculpt the and use the same techniques um, and things, but I, I wouldn't have ever have sort of thought about all the glazes and explosions in kilns and things like that i've just got these visions now of that uh, shed the cow shed that you've got all the kilns in just blowing up one day <laughs> just walking past <laughs> well, a massive but... explosion and wayne comes out with his hair all uh, disheveled 
<laughs> it, it tends to be that the work blows up inside the kiln and yeah. takes out any other work that's with it, as opposed to the actual kiln blowing up. But, you know, we, we, we keep trying. <laughs> so is that something that happens then? Somebody, If someone messes up and they puts their work in that's not got a hole in it, then it blows up everybody else's work. Yeah, yeah, it can shatter other pieces, but like other people's work. So if you put it in for a bisque firing, pieces can touch slightly. Yeah. Um, and, and if, say, say if these are in the kiln right now, um, this blew up, it, it could just shatter ev everything that's near it completely. Or so partially. We, we recently had, I think, um, one, um, someone in my year in the ceramics, uh, his work blew up earlier this year in the kiln because he's not, he just layered clay on clay on clay. And there must've been a, some bubble, air bubbles in it. It just blew up and shattered on that one. Yeah. There's also, if, if clay is too damp as well, then when you mm -hmm. put it in the kiln, it has to be absolutely dry to go in. So otherwise, again, the moisture, you know, kind of expands within the clay and, and will bl kind of blow off areas. Or if there's impurities in the clay, that can make areas kind of shell off. And, and that can be used as a technique, but yeah, it's a, it's a bit um, disconcerting if you're having your work fired in the same kiln. <laughs> Somebody who's doing something yeah. a bit more experimental. I can imagine you become very unpopular very quickly yeah. <laughs> my, oh, that was my, my final piece my final uh, submission has just exploded because somebody's just put a piece next to it plaster plaster is one of the worst in the kilns so if you've used like a plaster mold for slip casting or um, you've had plaster on say uh, clay on plaster um, and you've got like a, a little fleck of it on you have to make sure everything's super clean because um, that'll blow up as well. It's one of the worst things is plaster. Do you do much work with plaster? Um, I actually did quite a lot on the um, project just gone, um, experimenting. So we'd, um, I've got a load of buckets and completely filled them with plaster and bubble wrap, um, looking at textures like octopus fly and suckers on tentacles. Um, we've got some really good, um, good outcomes with them. Um, I should have brought them over, they're in the other room. Um, they, they work really well. And, and that's the thing as well, like if you do get your plaster super clean and dry, you can press clay into it. So I'd, I'd had some pieces, um, it was like bubble, it was just crazy shapes of uh, like bubble wrap theme. Um, and I got my, I got like little tubes of clay and, and rolled them onto and it, um, you got like a reverse image of the bubble wrap on the clay. So that's when you have to be super careful about this fire in that piece is, is every bit of plaster off it, you know. And that's when that's when you have to be ultra careful. So is that something that you run through all your practice? Is like the sort of holes, dimples, that sort of stuff in your... Um, it's starting to become a regular theme, I've noticed. Um, I think it derives from when I doodle. So when I doodle, I always do like little, little circles and holes. And I'm, I'm noticing now it's coming into my work. <laughs> you must lot. be very popular in the uh, tryptophobia community. <laughs> the, there's a, a question uh, from its prodigy. Sophie, have you ever, ever heard of Kintsugi, the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery? Looks interesting. Yep. Yeah, that's, um, that's where they fix it with the um, gold. Yeah. Um, again, everything's coming back. So someone else um, on this uh, project we've just done, she had cracks in her piece, mm -hmm. and she hated she hated the outcome. Um, and so we got some. Was it copper leaf carriers? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We just, yeah, we decided that as it was a huge seat that we didn't have quite enough gold. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, the because of the colours that she was putting into the piece anyway, the, the copper leaf worked really well. I'm a bit yeah. sad that you knew that because I just Googled it and I was like just checking how to see it and everything else. And I was going to go, oh, that's the art of joining things with gold. But you sort of knew it already, so I'm a bit sad. Yes. Um, and they, they've also asked, do you want to try it? yourself do you want to go doing that sort of thing um i think I'd, i think i'd have a go at it if a piece of my work broke and i was devastated like if i ever did get that eagle back up you know i think that looks so good with all the the gold or the copper in between because um the technique i'm using now where i'm um, 
I'm rolling my little balls of clay and I'm pushing it. I use the same one for the feathers on the eagle. Um, and you, like, if you've noticed, I'm not actually scoring or slipping this because the, the clay is so soft. I'm pushing it hard enough for it to um, attach on them. But yeah, I think I think I would if a piece broke. I, I, I hold like I do fingers crossed, but you know, it's ceramics, it's, it's it's bound to happen. That's why if if you are making like one-off pieces, that's when you have to like be really careful because if if that breaks, then you know. Um, yeah, all right, you can make it again, but it might not be the same as first time. But if, say, you're batch producing and you crack a, and you make like 20 mugs, say, you know, one, one broken one isn't particularly the end of the world. Um, that. So there's a few, we just had a new follow from Stephlees44. Thank you very much for the follow. And Sapling Wolf has put, they believe that the flaws added to the piece of art uh, deserve to be highlighted. And then it's Prodigy's put, it's philosophical as well, isn't it? To repair something that's broken. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice, isn't it? That that kind of, we we have that you know, whole kind of narrative of having an object. So there's the, the there's the kind of story of it being made. So you know the yeah. kind of Sophie's literally putting her fingerprints into into the clay, and then once it's gone through its kind of its making process, and then goes out into the big wide order. There's then a story about why somebody's bought it, and then so, you know, kind of, so maybe it's, you know to treat themselves or to celebrate something or commemorate something, and or a gift to somebody. And then with kind of handmade objects, you also have that kind of the story of the life so whether it's chips and ceramics you know with you know kind of if somebody's got like a favorite mug or a favorite plate or something you know sometimes you get those chips but it's kind of part of the history of owning it or you know like a wedding ring will get scratches on it over over time and it's that kind of like telling that story of the life of the object i think it's a and I, I completely agree with its project prodigy it's about that kind of celebrating and also a uh, sapling wolf about celebrating the the history and the story of the object yeah. rather than discarding it Mm -hmm. and, and from a sort of ethical point of view as well is is reduce reuse recycle no more plastic in the ocean not that it's ceramics is plastic yeah but it's <laughs> it's more romantic to think about the story of the life <laughs> of, the, of the object <laughs> and something to just stick in a bit of super glue on it to keep your porridge going in the morning yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, i think i think a lot of my work like um speaking on that a lot of my work has had messages behind it like um so the, the project the eagle came from that was highlighting um it might not come across straight away but if, if like like it'll come across now i looked at how um like uh what was it um nuclear fallout affects like animals and mutations and um, so that's what i was coming across with that one so the whole steampunk kind of machinery effect um, came into play, you know, affecting the animals and changing how they look. Um, and then in my in my foundation year, I've done um, plastic polluting the oceans. Um, I've done a massive, I did a big exhibition on that one um, as well. So I, I, I kind of like to highlight issues that are going on in the world within my work. I'm making it look pretty, but it's not pretty in like the sense that we are harming our world. Yeah, it's certainly making people think about. Yeah, yeah, there's like uh, single use plastics and stuff. Yeah, definitely. I think people are starting to get sick of the sound of me talking about plastics in the ocean at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to incorporate it into all projects. I mean, I think yeah, that's definitely... why. Like, I think that's why clay is such good material. Like, if you're if you're painting with say acrylics and they've got plastics in them, you know, you've got all these microplastics. Like if you're gonna use ceramics, like I said, you can reclaim the, the clay you don't use. So on my desk now I've got all these like little bits that I'm probably really not going to use at all. Um I'd let them I'd like you just put them into water, let them stay wet, or if they do go completely bone dry, you re-soak them again. 
and um, you can reuse the clay. So I think that's another beauty of, of ceramics is there's not a lot of waste if you're good with the clay. So what? So if you after you glazed that and fired it and everything else, what would happen then if you if it, if if it sort of smashed into bits? Could you reuse that ceramic for anything um, else? I think if if you could find another way, like another use for it. So like the whole like we spoke about kitsuke and fixing. Yeah. But if this were to smash into pieces, you know, you, you could add it to a say a previous or a, a newly being built piece. It depends. It all depends. Like. What, what you want to do with it if you know you're going to try your best not to throw away. So, so yeah, you can um, kind of grind or smash up pieces of mm. fired ceramic, can't you? Then add them to yeah, the yeah. clay bodies. To... So you can make like a super groggy clay. So yeah. this this clay I'm using is um, smooth. So a, a grog clay, it's got like little bits of stone and grit in. I think, I think this clay, yeah. So you, you could essentially grind it back down and put it in on those. I'm, I'm not sure what happens if it's being glazed, no. um, but so I'll have to that check, that check with an actual yeah, ceramicist. Yeah. But definitely, if it's being fired <laughs> and unglazed, you can you can break it down and then add it as a as a grog or as a texture mm. within new clay that you're you're building, unfired clay that you're building. And we've actually got a third year who's been doing that. She's been kind of gathering uh, as well as adding kind of fired clay to her work. She's also been kind of gathering up sort of tiny bits of sand and pebbles and shells that she's been kind of washing and firing and then adding to the clay body to create um, more texture and, and surface. Sounds it, it sounds, uh, it sounds great. And it, I, I like that idea of, of reusing stuff. It's uh, certainly an interesting process. We've got um, Beth and Parry Makes. Hiya, sorry I'm late. So if you know Beth and Parry Makes, which we do because she was on a, a chat a few a few weeks ago, I don't know if it's if we can accept that apology and you know we should should have been on time, surely. <laughs> it's okay. Beth, Beth, Beth can um, can add to my side of the fact that metal's dead good. Ceramics <laughs> is also dead good. <laughs> But it's something that I want to try and get. Um, it, it, obviously, in the coming weeks over the summer, while the, the studios are quiet and stuff, is is get some get some jewelers on as well to to, to show. Metal's just stuff. loud. Just, they're just like if you're stressed, if you're really stressed, you can go and like hammer metal forever. And you feel great. <laughs> that would be me, buddy, on a stream. It'd just be people like, especially people wearing headphones right now. It'd just be like constant like <laughs> like ringing in their ears. Uh, Beth then party makes is put metals dead good. <laughs> there you go. That's the end of that argument. Beth, Beth <laughs> I would ask you, um, what have you done with the little coloured things I gave? If you put them in your garden. She probably say yes. Uh, in pots. She's put ceramics are messy and noisy. <laughs> See, I feel like I've started the war now. <laughs> Ceramics is good, man. So you you said that you're you're making uh, coral sort of themed pieces today. How have you come how have you come to to come to that concept? How have you come up with that idea? Uh, it's just something I enjoy making. It's it's satisfying and um you know the, the thing with coral is like you don't you don't have to be perfect. Like some people think, oh, if, you, if you're making ceramics, it's got to be all smooth and, and look great. But with with coral. You know, it's all unique. No, it doesn't matter if, oh, if I've screwed up somewhere. Like these, these are just dead rough. Obviously, thumb, thumb straight in, and it's just great. I just all my all my work that like, I've shown people in the past, and, and they seem to like like my sea work, like sea life work. Yeah, because that seems like a, another theme that goes through your work with obviously the octopi and then. That you've done with the the seats and now you're doing coral mm -hmm. is that something and yeah now we've and we've talked about plastics in the ocean so is that something that's a uh, you know a big part of your yeah it's just getting the message across to people you know um because like there's a moral behind or like there's a reason behind why i'm making my pieces it's just so people know like they could turn around and be like oh well why are you making that and it's like well 
if you, if you read why well, I, I can sit there and describe to them why I'm making it and they, they might just go ah oh, kind of thing so because it's, it's some of those topics that you don't you don't talk about like an everyday conversation or at least you don't you don't hear about it a lot well you do a bit these days because of like global warming and like, like there's a lot at the minute about plastic recycling and how the UK doesn't recycle so much or whatever but um well, Wales is the best in the in the UK at recycling we're on the map we're green I think, was it <laughs> there's something just been released recently about yeah. how we don't do it well enough and that's the problem isn't it we don't do mm. it this I think it's is it Sweden or somewhere like that who literally don't have any landfill it's all everything's recycled it's what well, it's it's a country in Europe anyway but it's something that we should all be doing um Bethan's put I've got some in the garden some in the house nice there you go. I hope you brighten your life well not your life but like brighten your day every time you see them because I know you love them see this is the thing like when people see what I've made they're like oh, wow I want that you know I love that and it just it like warms my heart honestly and, and Bethan's also put third in the world for recycling. Is that third? Are you saying Wales is third in the world or the UK is third in the world? Because I see, I seen the map the other day, and and Wales is uh, was like top or something like, or near the top for recycling in the UK. We, we were green on the map. There's a lot of red areas. Um, Bethan's put they're awesome. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Was what what was that? You said they were coloured things. Um, they were um, maquettes, so like before before we make our final pieces, um, you do test pieces, um, also known as like maquettes, yeah. um, to test what kind of technique you're going to use. Mm -hmm. um, like you're not going to go into a piece of work straight away and be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to do it this way, that way. Like um, my suits were originally going to have one like big tentacle coming out of the back. Um, on each of them for like, like a back press, but in the end, I never I never ended up using them because um, they just looked great as they were already. Um, so I, I tested like patterns that I could have put on. Um, and then I'd also tested the glazes um, as well, because depending on like texture or if you've got no texture or texture, like glazes pool um, and they drip. So lead, lead glazes are super runny. Um, so you always have to be careful with them, um, so they don't stick to the kiln shelves whilst they're in for firing. So I, I've always made maquettes um, before going to final pieces, because I don't want to... It's just in a sense of knowing, like, you're safe using that technique and, it, you know, it's not going to ruin your work at the end of the day. I think a lot of people as well with coming here have realised, like, how important make like having maquettes and making yeah. them all just testing yeah and i think also this year as well because we, we've been so fortunate to have the workshops open to you guys kind of all the way through that's one another the shout out to wales and the fact that we were we managed to keep our our practice based courses going when the english courses had to shut down for nine weeks Mm -hmm. But it's um, but it means that because we've ha we had to um, this year reduce it to one day a week full access to the workshop per year group, it, it means that that kind of designing, that maquette making and testing became even more important because you had to really know what it was you were going to be doing when you then went into the material for mm -hmm. those workshop days. Yeah. So like um, coming from like a clay like ceramicist point of view, um, working with clay like one day a week. Um, it, it's really hard, so, although it is hard, like, we, we have been so lucky to have that one day a week coming in, um, you just, you just have to think about, like, the time scales and timekeeping, um, and it also highlights how important that is as well when working with these materials. Yeah, I mean, we, as staff, we were talking about this last week, about the, you know, kind of amongst ourselves, about how, how well all our students at all the different levels have, have kind of coped with with this one day a week rather than having um you know the the full open access that we used to have because of the covid restrictions but the 
we're, we're really impressed with how there, there isn't really a drop in production between the amount of work that was being produced when students could come in five days a week compared to when they come in they've been coming in one day a week and I think it's it's made everybody a lot more kind of focused so when they're in the workshops they're really focused on on producing the work that they want to make but also I think that kind of the time your know, time management and, and kind of getting everything done it's it's I mean if you think about the scale of the pieces that you guys and ceramics have done in yeah. 12, well, 12 workshop huge. days this semester you've had 12 workshop days and you've mm -hmm. all produced these huge big ceramic seating and actually yours is probably the smallest that I was looking for. Oh, it's the smallest, yeah. <laughs> it is. Um, you know what? They've, been, they've been made, they've been fired, they've been glazed and then glazed fired. You know, so it's it's kind of really impressive. So this again is just literally balls of clay pushed onto the surface. Well, That's it's great. Very so easy. effective. Yeah. And um, this would work um really well and um, once it's fired with um, an oxide on the top. Mm -hmm. So yeah you wipe the oxide on, um, make sure it's really thick, and then you wipe it away, and it'll highlight all these like areas of detail, um, and then you can put um, a glaze on top of that, and it will burn through um, many pieces around here. Well, are you, are you gonna be, once, you, you, once you've done that, are you gonna be posting it on your Instagram so we can see that? Oh, if, if we can keep them safe, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping. We'll certainly um, share it on the Art Design Wales for people to see that, because it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I mean, just a short space of time that you produce something like that. The one next to it looks like, from this angle, like this, what I'm seeing anyway, it looks like some sort of chameleon's head or some sort of lizard's head. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with a with a funky eye. Well, that reminds me, I need to put a hole in the other thing. So this is the thing now. See, I've forgotten to put a hole there because otherwise that would blow with that being hollow on the inside. So there he is, just... I know I said it could be a pinprick, but I like the Well, I've certainly learned something new today. So the, the, the ornaments that my mum used to have in her house, why they all had holes in the bottom. And it wasn't so I could hide pens in them and stuff. <laughs> um, it would have been, been two reasons. Um, one, um, probably they were slip cast, yeah. which means that they would always have a hole in. Yeah, and um, yeah, and also yeah, you need a hole so it doesn't blow up. We've done slip casting. We've actually done so much. So in that in that first year, you um, you go around all your different materials, and then you learn all different different techniques. Like we did mold making, and then we slip cast the molds we made. Um, and that's what we do. Don't forget the wood workshop as well. Um, there's a wood workshop here. So if you ever want to like turn wood on the lathe, use band saws, so much opportunity. And for the 3D printers out there, we've we've also just, just set up or we're setting up a, a 3D printing space as well with the, a large format 3D printer that's about a meter by a meter. So so big they'd have to take a door out to get it in the building. So yeah. <laughs> so a few comments in the chat. Beth Parry makes has put Wales, so that's third in the world for recycling. Uh, Kiss My Heart Chugs put Wales is on it. Um, Steph Lee has put looks amazing, Sophie. Hi, um, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> Funkatron, oh damn, I never knew that. So I'm assuming that's about the holes in the ceramic. So. Sophie, out of your two years with us so far, mm -hmm. is what what do you think is your biggest kind of thing you've learned, or, or the kind of the phrases that you've heard most often that you kind of mm -hmm. have drilled into you? <laughs> there's, there's one phrase that's, dr that's drilled in, and uh, Wayne will hate us. I'll, I'll get him to do it next year. It's crystalline glazes. Really want to try. <laughs> he's going to hate me. I bet he's in the other room. Um, Mold making, I've never made a mold before, and um, so that was really good fun. And um, I've never ever worked with metal apart from college, but that wasn't as detailed as, as um, what I've done here. So, jewelry, metal making, everything there was new for me. Um, I enjoyed it, I enjoyed parts of it, and parts of it was just like I don't want to get my fingers burnt every like two minutes on the blowtorch. <laughs> <laughs> so 
You you mentioned there that you've done moulding. I walked into the Applied Arts building once. So I was looking to borrow some sort of tool because that's my go-to thing to borrow tools. And Howard and Wayne were in there with, uh, is it alginate? Algin and they had their noses. Yeah. They were putting their noses in cups to cast <laughs> their noses. Was that, was that when we were in there as well? We were doing noses, fingers. Yeah, probably. Um, just walked oh, in and there was yeah. two, two grown men with their nose in a cup. <laughs> That was good fun, yeah. No, we did. We did alginate. What was there? We did wax casting. What was there? What was the red stuff, Garris? I forget it. That, that's gel flex, that which gel is flex. again for making yeah. molds. So if you use the jasmineite or resin, or yeah, you, know, you can get wax in there that you then do turn you know, burn the wax out of something else to turn it into metal or glass or anything really. And we we, we kind of just play around with loads and loads of materials. And, and yeah, do strange things like sticking noses into cups. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that was good fun, though. Yeah. Because <laughs> one thing I I learned quite recently is you've also got a forge. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. As well, which is I don't think many places or well, many universities have got a, an actual full blown forge. So all those forged in fire sort of fans out there. Yeah, we've got we've got we've got the, the blacksmith forge. We've also got a foundry set up as well. So we we cast um, yellow bronze, uh, brass, silver, gold, aluminium. So we kind of cast metal as well. So yeah, if any anyone's interested in the all the glitters, because <laughs> we can we can talk we can talk about um, the the British throwdown as well. But all the glitters, you know, all the techniques that I've been doing, we've been. And are critiquing them each week. <laughs> well, it's it, it has been, there's been a massive influx, isn't it, of all these competitions, like the the glass blowing one uh, competition, yeah. the all the glitters, and the Great <coughs> British Throwdown. It just seems to have absolutely blown up recently with all these different programs. Or com not just programs, but the competitions, aren't they? Of people that you know showing off their mastery and stuff like that in certain. I think Forged in Fire was probably the first and, and the best, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you've also got like the Sewing Bee and you've got kind of the yeah. Great British Bake Off. And I think, I think people just like to do things with their hands. You know, it's that kind of, sort of lost skill really, isn't it? That, that people, I think, are rediscovering that, you know, that whole kind of like wanting to, you know, create something or make something. Mm -hmm no matter whether that's kind of in textiles or whether it's baking cakes and decorating them. Obviously, cake, cakes have got advantages that you can eat them afterwards. Well, well, if you're good at, if you're good at decorating cakes, I mean, like, there's definitely skills that come into decorating like ceramics as well. <laughs> when, I put the, um, when I put the like slabs of clay on top of these, it um, felt like I was icing like a cake. Great, but don't eat clay. But it, it is it is kind of the, I think there is a real link though between baking and and yeah. making mm -hmm. things because within the applied arts we've always had really really talented bakers who who thankfully bring in cakes for the rest of us to eat but it's um so yes yeah, so I think there is some kind of link between that whole kind of baking and making and I think with lockdown recently people have sort of like there was a shortage at one point of flour because the amount of people that were baking. <laughs> so it was kind of it, it, it becomes that escapism as well because we've talked about this for the last few weeks about sort of arts and mental health and stuff and there's something I don't know just sort of nice about watching somebody make something as well yeah even as a kind of professional maker I have like, I, get, I get really sucked into you know those um those videos of where they're kind of icing yeah. cakes and they're mm -hmm. kind of pouring all these layers and it's all kind of dribbling off with a mirror glaze and I've got no desire to ever try it myself yeah. but I get really sucked into it I can't help but watch it all the way through I think yeah. there is something really kind of addictive to watching yeah. people make things that is that my that's my go-to thing I don't do anything with metal or ceramics or anything like that so my thing's all digital but yeah, I'll, you'll find yourself watching videos on YouTube or Facebook or whatever of people turning wood or pouring resin or doing making tools out of bits of metal and stuff. So I've completely neglected the chat a little bit. So um, Beth Parry makes that's why we're the best. So I'm assuming that was for when they were talking about. Oh yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's some sort of weird war going to be starting soon, isn't there? Uh, Bethan's also put Manor Arms Reforged on YouTube is awesome. Adele 
as per uh i can't bake um my cakes always end up very wrong um beth patty makes steve makes really good cake yeah <laughs> uh, i've made i've made the odd cake in my time no no it's not very often though I, we don't do that much anymore but uh funkatron's put oof love making a good cake and totally relate to those videos and then a slice of pizza as an emote too oh, I like, obviously likes making pizza too the great the, the, the biggest question there is do you put pineapple on your pizza yeah yeah it's fine honestly pineapple on pizza is okay and these people are saying oh, banana on pizza who puts banana on pizza pineapple on pizza is fine but not uh, banana i have to disagree that that you fruit has no place on a pizza um, what have we started I, I, why is tomato on pizza isn't tomato a fruit yeah, but I, I don't, I don't, I pick off, if it's proper, for like fresh tomato, I'll get a pick, I'll pick it off anyway, <laughs> or ask for it without it. But, um, but yeah, the, I, I did some teaching at a, a really cool university in Finland on the, the ceramics and glass course. And um, I got taken to, to a pizza place in, in the town where this university was. And um, it was the best menu in the world, because it was just so entertaining, because the first, you had like kind of your, your margarita was your first one. And then, as it went around, it was basically it was the, whatever the pizza was before, but with something else added to it. So you ended up with like the randomest mix, and they put peaches on pizza, and I was like, no, 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 <laughs> no, you don't have you don't have fruit on a pizza. <laughs> I think uh, Funkatron's not too happy that you're putting pineapple on pizza in the chat. Oh, Adele, Adele's put it's fine, oh, but no, don't like <laughs> sweet pizza. There's lots of there's lots of spewing emojis uh, or emotes. Uh, Funkatron might as well out chocolate sauce on it. You can get sweet pizzas though. You can yes. get like chocolate pizzas and stuff, yeah. can't you? Kiss my artichokes, but yes, pineapple is lovely on pizza. I'm sure if we keep talking about pizza, I might end up having pizza for me tea. Oh, there's uh, a pizza just behind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a pizza hut right next to yeah. it. Uh, right. Right next to it. Pizza hut. <laughs> uh, Funkatron's put, oh my god, not you too, Kiss my, so kiss my artichoke. With more spewing face emoji emotes. Uh, kiss my outro to Funkatron Hawaiian. How can how can millions of Hawaiian people be wrong? Uh, and he's, they've also put there's only one pizza. And we're waiting for to find out what that pizza is. So what is your favourite pizza, Sophie? Mine. Um. Mm. Depends. Depends on my mood. I usually go for like a mighty meaty, or or I make my own a lot. To be fair, um, just get the bases and right. You're all gonna really think I'm weird. So if I make my own pizzas, I've got to have pepperoni, uh, cheese tomato, anchovies, olives, uh, onion, and like three cheeses. Wow, anchovies are just nasty. Yeah, no, no, they're the best. You, you're Honestly. going on about you're going on about the ocean and protecting the ocean. And everything else, you eat anchovies. Oh, you eat anchovies. No, no, anchovies that are not from the sea. Oh, bread. <laughs> have you seen Have you seen the documentary Sea Spiracy on uh, Netflix? Wow. I'll put you off eating anchovies. <laughs> um, but it's, I, I'm we I'm f tried for a, for for a little bit to be vegan. Um, so we had a vegan pizza a few weeks ago, which was quite nice. Um, Adele's put, I disagree, anchovies are amazing. Yeah. Kiss my artichokes put, I could go for some pizza now. Cheers, Steve. You're very welcome. <laughs> Kiss my artichokes put, anchovies with spewing emo emotes as well. This this is now turned in from, it's turned from ceramics. I'm loving your ceramics <laughs> to... How to make, uh, to, to what's your favourite pizza? Your favorite uh, pizza? Uh, and Funkatron's put also, I made a vegan cake once, was weird but tasty. Uh, kiss my heart jokes, but save the oceans, don't eat fish. There you go. <laughs> Not to mention they're full of microplastics as well. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing as well. So this this Twitch channel could become, what well, as Funkatron's put in the chat, great arty bake-off. 
Yeah, so I think yeah. it could be like we might have to start start setting challenges to people who come on about baking a cake. I, I think uh, never mind challenges for for just this. I think in the workshops we're going to have to do a. You can only come into the workshop if you bring cake. <laughs> I, I'm all for that. That's this Friday. Outside though, don't eat the workshop. Kiss my <laughs> jokes, but you you need to make a ceramic slice of pizza now. Might have one at home. <laughs> oh, already. No, honestly, no, honestly, I think I do, I do have one I made in college for some spare play. I do have a little slice somewhere. I think it was pepperoni though. <laughs> Funkatron in the chat is agreeing with that. Um, so let, let's get back on to <laughs> what we originally started out with, ceramics and uh, and chatting. Challenges, what's been the biggest challenge for you since starting university? Throughout like COVID? Or... Just in general, um, what's been the biggest challenge in terms of your work, in terms of what have you had to learn, something like that? Well, I think... I think COVID has definitely been the the biggest um, challenge. Going from three days a week being able to like make to reducing that down to one, and obviously learning all these um, like time management skills and making sure you know what you're going to do when you come in for that five six hours of the day. Um, definitely, that's that's been a big challenge. Um, would you say that's made you more resilient or more sort of um, giving you additional skills from them? I think you all, that's all. Like, I think it's, if anything, it's made me want to try harder. Because, um, you know, I was just, just so thankful for being able to come out for that one day a week. Because um, I, know, I know some courses have had no um, workshop time at all. So we've been very, very lucky to be able to come out and make safely, definitely. Um, I think, I think it was, <laughs> I don't think it was the hardest thing, which is one of the things I dislike, because doing the whole glaze theory, yeah. oh, having to mix all the glazes up. So I think it was, was it 60, 62 glazes we had to mix from scratch. So we had to weigh out, I, I had a stoneware glaze, so I had five materials, five or six, that I had to weigh out 62 times to get 62 types of blues. Hmm. My Lord. <laughs> that was, that was. Sounds like fun, sounds like a lot of maths. A lot of patience, patience for that, definitely. Oh. So in your work, do you ever step outside of your comfort zone? Um, yeah, I try, try, try to do new things. Um, oh. Even though, like, I tell myself, like, oh, I don't want that to be like that. Like, that's why, that's why we have maquettes. So, like, if you, if you can try it, if you don't like it, it's not your final piece. So, you can, you can document, be like, oh, I've tried it, didn't like it, move on, try something else. Uh, what, what have I done that was out of my comfort zone? Um, well, mm -mm, not exactly mold making. Um, I know I've been so focused on all my work for, the, for this final project. It's like, well, well, thankfully that's out of the way now. Worked hard for that. But yeah, no, I, I try to push myself um, to go out of my comfort zone for new new things. It's like originally those those two would have been just plain red. Um, however, I took advice um, from one of our other tutors, Wendy, and she said, "Don't, don't do it one colour because it'll look awful." Um, and you know, and you listen, you listen because these are the people that have got like years of experience yeah. um, working with the materials, so they're definitely like they're, they're going to know um, the outcomes of things better than than we do. Because like I've only been doing it for what five five educational years. So I've not done it professionally, selling wise yet. So always, always take advice from those who've done it. Um, you know, you've got a great team of tutors here that um, also do, like they work in their own time, making, selling. Yeah. 
because I know notice in applied arts everyone all is is still working in yeah whether they're in the industry or whether they've got their own workshop at home whether they're building a workshop or whether they're taking on commissions or doing stuff for people and there's always little bags of jewels turning up in the mm. pigeonholes in the office there's always <laughs> you can always see um wayne's doing stuff with ceramic whales and stuff like that so it's it does seem like it, everybody that works in that team is right on it mm -hmm. uh betham has put your huge paint pendulum was great oh yeah that, that was really good fun big 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 mess don't care big messy <laughs> <laughs> just have fun like i was having fun with that project so we had to um we had to pick from a list of um that we were given from like historical figures um and decide a gift we would give to them um i think i had Valen um, valentina terestrova she was the first um female to orbit the earth so going to space really um so that's why i went for the whole lines because it was like the satellite uh, not the satellite uh the little rocket she was in orbiting the earth when she was up there so everything everything kind of links to what i was doing so that's that's where that came from just having fun playing around um and half the time that's when you you, you notice and you think oh i really like how that's how, like turned out you know I can, I can do that again in the future sort of thing so i i just have fun yeah absolutely because that's one thing that we've, we've sort of taken away from everybody who's mm -hmm. done these streams is that it's just have fun with it just try something new and have a go because yeah. we, like i said when we were setting up today we were just chatting and just saying about you know there's a i asked the, the, the silly questions that you know not someone watching might not necessarily know but they might not want to ask uh, and also people are sort of scared to take the plunge and have a go you know they don't know what to buy like when we've talked to the fine artists about people painting on canvas and stuff they're like well not everybody paints on canvas it could just be a piece of cardboard mm -hmm. it could just be a decorator's brush that's a pound from the shop and some acrylic paint that's a quid yeah uh, you know it's it's picking it's up like, some, it's like some for the pool. Or... Like, we, we could use knives and forks and, yeah. and still be able to get like not not maybe this kind of finish mm -hmm. but we'd still get some great textures and like finishes like designs and stuff so just just you can start off so simple yeah. and then that's your journey then it's the starting point you're taking the first step and then your next thing is you, it, it, you could end up sort of doing this as a as a in, in university mm. which we'd like you to come and do <laughs> uh and and then you you've got a career out of it and it's something that you, you enjoy doing it's kind of like we all, I always say to students you know you've got a long time on this planet to work and if you enjoy what you do then it's mm. not work at all it's there is a, there is some weird saying or some saying that i always forget but you know if you can do something that you enjoy and your work becomes a hobby or work becomes a yeah something yes. that, that you're passionate about like, oh, well, you know well, why don't you have like so much work to do and it's like well i don't really see coursework as coursework yeah. Except from written stuff, um, you know, I don't, I don't see it as such a chore because, like, I enjoy doing it. Well, that could be the sad side of me enjoying paperwork. <laughs> uh, CAA Silversmith. I'm wondering if that could be. Um, might not be rich, but you'll have a rich life as a maker. Mm. So there you go. That's a good saying. It is. It's. Um, there's a lot to be said for, for having a, a career and a job that you, you really love and enjoy. Oh, there it is. Go. Yeah, I mean, it's not, I, I'm not saying that it's this idyllic life being a maker. <laughs> I mean, there's a, as I'm sure Sophie will attest to, there's times where you get really frustrated with the material or it's kind of not doing what you want it to do. And But it's it's but that kind of... You have off days, like you definitely have off yeah. days. Yeah. But, uh... but it, but it's that satisfaction of when you finish something and you step back and go, yeah, it's I not bad, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Funkotron's put, have you ever used foam clay? Um, I bought the cheap stuff um, when I was at home. The I think it was just something from B&M. Um, 
that that was good actually so obviously having to adapt with covid making from home like i don't i don't have particular like a kiln at home i don't have like a a whole area i can do ceramics it's just in the spare room um I so I bought the foam, I bought some clay so I could work from home um, making test pieces. This was at the very beginning of the uh, final project for this year. Oh my God, that was in that was in February. That's flown by. Um, but yeah, no, I've used it sometimes. I'm not a fan of um, air drying clay, but it doesn't work the same as um, standard out the ground clay. Um, it doesn't doesn't dry nicely. It's not good to work with you. With fingers, it was horrible. So I have tried that, didn't like it. Um, I've not used Sculpey and I've not used polymer clay. Um, mm -hmm. So I might have to invest in that over summer. Sculpey is interesting and interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can make a lot of things, a lot of a lot of figures get made out of it. A lot of stop motion um, mm -hmm. puppets and things get made out of it. Does and I think, or does it stay? Like that. You well, no, you can you can leave it dry, but you you tend to just you put it in the oven. Oh, okay, yeah. As long as you don't leave it in there too long, it'll go black otherwise. But you can yeah. just you can sort of let it air dry as well. But um, it's certainly interesting. It's it's kind of like um, when you're making faces and things like that. You tend to use foil, get mm. the, the basic shape of the the skull well, yeah. of the face. With this, so instead of foil, I've used like the newspaper. Yeah basic shape and then mm -hmm. working on top of that like like now i'm currently cutting out um areas you know because you can do that as well it just gives that that firmness so you, you know you're not going to fear of holding it and squashing it mm -hmm. i tell you um someone who does a lot with sculpey that um keith lemon yeah, well, at the lock during the lockdown he has started his own youtube yeah. channel and he he actually sculpts um celebrities and um sort of popular Seth, culture Seth characters Rogan. and things. Seth Rogen's got his own, um, mm -hmm. he, I didn't know he does pottery. Yeah. He's got some really fab um, pots. I don't know what glaze or, or his technique, but they're amazing, they're so bright. I think during lockdown, we we found that uh, there's a lot of celebrities out there yeah. that have been to art school. And they've just gone into acting or presenting or whatever else, but mm -hmm. like, you know, like Harry Hill, he's an artist. Vic yeah. Reeves, Jim, I always forget his second name. Um, he, you know, he's an artist. You've got Keith Lemon, you've got all Lee Francis, or whatever his uh, real name is. You know, it's kind of... Uh, I think Kedis told me about the guy from the Kaiser Chiefs as well. Yeah, Ricky, Ricky Wilson. Wilson. Yeah, yeah, he did a BA and an MA at art yeah. school. So, so yeah, you get a lot of musicians who went to art school, yeah. but it's also, but then you've got even people like Simon Rimmer, the chef, he has got a degree in textiles before he became a chef. So yeah, it is, and, and of course you've got the, the ultimate um, celebrity ceramicist, so Johnny Vegas. And, yeah. um, and also, I'm sure I read that um, George Clooney took up ceramics during lockdown in a, <laughs> he could have started throwing <laughs> pots. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's become the thing to take up, I think. So, because you're um, spinning that board round, do you ever do yeah. the stuff on the actual potter's wheel? I'm not very good at it, but I have given it a go. But then saying that, like, it comes with the comes with practice, you know. Um, we just started before lockdown last year, um, learning how to throw. But then I remember coming in and they were like, oh, we're not sure with COVID yet if you can stay. And then, you know, like, we, we couldn't stay. But um, you do you do learn how to throw. Um, I, I'm not the best. I've not done so much. I, I've had a few really good pieces. Um, ish, they were small. But um, it'll come with time. And the more, the, more, the more you do it, the better you get. Yeah, absolutely. Practice definitely makes yeah, perfect. Yeah. You can, it's like with those videos, you see people with the like the hypnotizing pottery videos and yeah. oh, just, I just sit there and think one day maybe I'll be able to do that as well. <laughs> well, you can, you can revisit the videos. So we've been producing yeah, yeah. videos for, um, for our students so that they can 
kind of learn the techniques and revisit those videos over and over again before they come into the workshops to then be actually practicing and making. So yeah, so Sophie, you can you can rewatch or Wayne's mm -hmm. throwing videos. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think that's that's another positive that's come out of the pandemic is the amount of resources now that students get from all the videos that we've created from software tutorials to throw in tutorials to metal work and things like that. Because at the moment, I mean, we're in complete, all three of us are in completely different locations. Mm -hmm. So again, the power of Zoom and, and Twitch has allowed that you know, you're in the middle of Wrexham, Sophie. I, I'm just on the outskirts of Wrexham and Keris is in Manchester. So, yes. Yeah. And this morning, I was talking to a group of students in Truro in Cornwall. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. The, 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 and also the, the all the galleries that have opened up resources that that normally wouldn't be online. So yeah. during the first lockdown, it's like, oh, you could you could go to you know um, the the Met in New York in the morning, and then the afternoon you could be wandering around. I don't know, the Prado in in mm -hmm. Madrid. Yeah. And it's it's the kind of stuff that you would never be able to get for free normally no, so no. that is that has been one of the really real benefits absolutely and it's yeah like i say yeah well, yeah like I say it's just opened up a whole sort of new world to people especially people who, who sort of maybe couldn't afford to travel or maybe sort of just not had the opportunities to travel and go and see these things i mean obviously they, you know it'd be nice to see things in real life but you know, just yeah. being able to walk around galleries and stuff and being anywhere in the world has it's been great. Oh, absolutely. And it's that because there's no kind of financial cost, is it? So it's that kind of so every year um the Crafts Council put on this big exhibition, selling exhibition called Collect mm -hmm. in London. And it always falls on an open day. So I never get to go down because mm -hmm. it's over a weekend. And um and obviously because they couldn't do it because it's October time. They couldn't do it this year, so um, in real life, so they they put on an actual exhibition, but then it was all filmed. The they all the talks that you normally have to book into were kind of recorded and free, so you could then watch them whenever. And it was such a fantastic resource, and you know, and it's available all around the world then. And and the other thing that's really struck me is that you know the amount of artists and makers who are, are kind of. Just give you know, kind of showing those kind of studio tours with a this is how I make my work at home or in my studio and being really open and okay, like sort of lifting the curtain as to how things are made. That's been that's definitely been a good thing. Yeah, I mean the amount of people that have come out like like done videos on social media and stuff of how things are made. Even like us doing this of students' process and stuff because we like we all, I will say this we don't get time to watch students make stuff. You know, so it, it's it's great being able to sort of lift the curtain on this and, and see you actually create something from clay. Because all we normally get to see is there's a bucket of clay, next thing you fired it, and we've got to look at a document or however you hand in your work, whether that's PDF or a folder or whatever else of, of your process, and it's the odd photograph. Yeah, I mean, I, I do miss... I mean, I, because I'm in the workshops with the students, I do see the process. I don't stand there watching them, but I do kind of see the process it goes through. <laughs> and um, and so I do fit, see the finished things as well. So I'm, I'm really glad I've got to do that because because there's a lot to be said for being able to kind of pick up a piece of work and look at it from every angle yeah. rather than just having a photograph. Because yeah. that's something they've talked about, about handing work in digitally for every course. But when, when you're on a making course, you kind of need to be able to sort of pick it up and flip it around. And, I mean, it's, all, it's, oh. it's okay, it's 3D scanning it and you can rotate it around, but... I it's, it's, I yeah, yeah, it's still not the same because, you know, yeah. so if, it could be that somebody's created a, a really beautiful looking cup, teacup, yeah. but if you go to pick it up and you actually need both hands because it's so thick and heavy. Yeah. <laughs> You, yeah. can, you can mask a lot with a photograph mm -hmm. where when you've actually physically got the object to touch yeah. then then you, you can really find out whether it's you know been executed well or not because mm -hmm. i wouldn't i would have thought that was a solid block of clay until you said that you put paper in it yeah 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 it's quite uh, it's like a, an illusion really yeah and i certainly wouldn't recommend once lockdown's over and all the art galleries are open and everything else that people go in and just start picking up the ceramics <laughs> and having a little look around. That's solid. Yeah. 
Oh, this is this is well made. It's that shaking it about. Um, <laughs> oh, it's a bit heavier than I thought. No, no, can you put that down? That that Ming vase. <laughs> However, saying that, I know that most museums and galleries do discourage you from touching things, but you can um, kind of go to when they have like kind of educational days and they will let you handle work. Mm. So you can and you can book into the V&A to, to actually be allowed to handle work. Obviously, not all of it, yeah. but some of it they'll let you handle in their collection. So. So yeah, so they, and you know, it's always really exciting. So you know, so before lockdowns, when uh, we take our students to Rith and Craft Centre, which is a really prestigious gallery that's kind of pretty close to us in Wrexham, and you know, they, they would let, literally let the students handle work. In, in in like obviously supervised, they weren't just yeah. like kind of, but but you were kind of like oh, so you could feel the weight of, of mm -hmm. something, or you know, it's kind of or you know, feel the you know, the, the quality of the making. Yeah. In, in a very supervised way but you know it, it is possible to be able to if you ask nicely to touch things <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna try that next time i'm in the louvre can i just touch <laughs> that paint in there <laughs> wow it's bumpy as long as it doesn't get kicked out <laughs> <laughs> but maybe craft galleries are a bit more kind of attuned yeah. to letting people touch things than, than oh. perhaps kind of i don't think you'll have to stroke the mona lisa no, no. the um we we went to we were in, last time I well, probably the last second to last time I was in the V&A, just trying to take a photograph and you had some security guard that looked a little bit like, like Tom Hardy like try and wrestle you to the floor. It so depends. Think, yeah, it depends uh, on what you're taking the photograph <laughs> of because they've got a lot, a lot of light sensitive stuff. There. Yeah. <laughs> your big flash goes off now. The sneaky little photo without your flash on. <laughs> So we've got a couple of minutes left. We've got about seven or eight minutes left because I know you've got to go and get a train. So it's kind of, um, we'll, we'll have to uh, wrap things up in a second. Mm. So question I've got for you now is, do you ever collaborate with your peers or other people in ceramics or, or metalwork or jewellery? Um, I don't think, I can't really think of how have we ever collaborated. I would collaborate. I definitely would consider it. Um. Oh, well, we definitely like it's not exactly collaboration as such, but we do all help each other. Yeah. So like, if one person doesn't quite know a technique, you know, help out. But work, work wise, um, I, I collaborate definitely. Yeah. I think it's always good to have that mix of of some like with previous work I've done with it not all being just ceramic to have that metal element and to mm -hmm. have you know maybe if I'm not quite qualified enough to to do certain metal techniques or make something, you know, to be able to have that person to help out, and vice versa, obviously. Yeah, I'd I think that. You did the ultimate collaboration in first year, didn't you, with the um, the uh, Creative Futures? Oh, um, yeah, that group work. Module in first year. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> nice yeah. memory there, of oh, that group work. <laughs> <laughs> I pop collab, yeah, no. Making wise, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Because you you put together with people from other disciplines that you might be put to you put with some like a digital artist or something that's yeah completely the opposite end of your the scale of what you do. So did you find that hard, or was that fairly straightforward? Or um, I think I'll work. Um, our team got along pretty pretty well, you know, we kept in touch, but like some aspects of it were tricky, especially like if you've got one person that doesn't turn up and then it's like the final three weeks and I'm like, so what have you guys been doing? And you're just thinking, oh, you know, um, but at the end of the day, it's like team building skills. So you learn you learn something new every year you, you're here so it's like it's like next year create futures three will be actually setting up like a a, a real working website and uh, making work to sell to go into centers and in galleries so it progresses every year you do it definitely so I've learned loads, I've learned loads. So like obviously going from college, not knowing how to price my work. And that guy said, oh, will you take this for it? And I'm like, oh, no. So if, if I had work in a, a gallery now, I'd, I'd be like, well, yeah, that's the price of it. So is that, <laughs> could you say that that's just, that's confidence or is that just not knowing how to price um, it? 
I think I think you've got to have it all. Like you've definitely got to have the confidence. Yeah. And um, if, if you're not confident enough with what you're making, then are you going to be proud of it? Are you going to be proud of those pieces you make? Um. And then working out the costings. You know, you have to have to be. You know, go by your hours. Um. Price wise, you don't want to not pay yourself enough yeah, with the work you make. Absolutely. And so, one, one thing I always ask, I ask the artists as well, when you sell stuff, mm. how does that feel knowing that that's going and are you, are you attached to it or is that, can you, can you put uh, that block up that's like, I think that, that's gone to a new home like, now? See if these pieces we're going to sell now, like I'm not particularly like attached, attached. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm proud I've made them, even though I have made them in like two hours. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't mind them going to a good home. You know, whether they get looked after, admired, yeah, um, kind of thing. That's why I was so upset about my eagle breaking. But you know, what can you do? Um, all the work I've got now is still at home, safe. Yeah, no, I think you've got to get in that mindset of I'm making this to sell. Yeah, can't get attached to it all. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you'd, you'd end up kind of buried under work if you kind of never it's thought anything. At that point, like, yeah, definitely. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. and selling is useful because it means that it gives you money that you, a, you can live, but also so you can then buy more clay or oh, more glazes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's in, it's in that like, cycle. Definitely. So. No, I enjoy what I do, what I have done. And I'm going to do. <laughs> so, Sophie, are you going to cover? Are you going to do your moisture management, which is the one thing that, if I've learned anything about ceramics, it's that oh, cover moisture. them with plastic so that they dry out slowly. Yeah, yeah. So we'll cover it. Things have to dry. Um, oh, so it we're we're coming to the end now, and Sophie, I think what you've produced in the last two hours. It's been absolutely phenomenal. It's, it's fantastic pieces of work. And yeah. if I didn't live with someone who who had tryptophobia, um, then I would be certainly interested in owning them sort of them pieces. Um, that's how I know what that um, phobia is, because <laughs> uh, we struggle we struggle with crumpets in our house. It's kind of. Um, but what you've what you've created is absolutely phenomenal. I think the theme that you've come up with with, with the under under the sea and everything else, and then I'm yeah. trying to raise awareness for that is, is fantastic. Uh, really appreciate you giving up your time today. Uh, I know you've had some difficulties with collapsing train stations on your way in today, Honestly. which uh, was, <laughs> was, was sort of you just managed to brush that off and, and turn it on time. Yeah. Um, so, in in the sort of tradition that we do at the end of streams we will uh, head off to a raid because we've got a few people watching um we do have a raid emote that you can if you've got enough credits on the on the chat that you can buy so I'd certainly use that emote and and spam the next stream the, the stream that we're going to go to i think we've we've raided them before they're um an artist over in germany but it's an english stream unlike last time when i sent everyone to uh, Portuguese stream and nobody could understand what was being said um, so I do apologise for that but um, one last time absolutely thank you very much so for people who are interested in what you do certainly head over to Instagram give Sophie um, a follow um, and if you want to purchase these pieces I'm sure you'll be able to send um, a message and once, once, once Sophie's finished these we will get them on um, our, our Instagram as well Okay, so I will hit the end screen uh, and then we will we'll head off for a raid. Okay, thanks again. Ooh, thank you. Yeah, bye. Thanks, Sophie. <laughs> no worries. <laughs>